So welcome to the Spring 2022 Diversity Grant Lecture. The Faculty Diversity Research and Curriculum Development Grants are awarded in support of research or curricular innovation regarding diversity. These grants are designed to encourage research and curriculum development on issues of diversity and faculty in any discipline. The LGBTQ plus research initiative grants are awarded to faculty engaged in research or creative work on the experiences of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning and intersex people and allies on Hofstra's campus and or in the suburbs. The grants are co-sponsored by the National Center for Suburban Studies at Hofstra University. Um, thank you, Larry. Um, we have a range of presentations today, so I'm not going to speak. We have six presentations. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to read out the first three, and then we'll talk about the second three. We're going to hold questions until the end, just to make sure that each presenter has time to get their presentation. So our first presentation is Scott Lafergie and Emily Moondorf from the Department of Chemistry. And their presentation is Improving Outcomes in General Chemistry for Underrepresented and Racially Minoritized STEM Undergraduates Through Early Intervention. The second, the second presentation is Song Lu from the Department of Psychology, Workplace Ostracism and Pro-Social Behaviors Among Employees with Minority Backgrounds. And then the third presentation is Sabrina Sobel and Vandana Bindra from the Department of Chemistry. And their presentation is titled, Mentoring and Training a Diverse Pool of Students as Peer Mentors for Introductory Chemistry Courses. So with that, I'm going to call our first speakers up and we'll get started. Thank you very much and thank you for being here today. Uh, our project is titled, Improving Outcomes in General Chemistry. Uh, for underrepresented and racially minoritized STEM undergraduates through early intervention. And this project was born of an observation that we made uh, that uh, we were troubled by. So first you should know that Chem 3A is a gateway course for all STEM students. So from engineering to nursing, chemistry, physics, biology, pre-health. Uh, and uh, it ends up being some, something of a, uh, a gatekeeper as well. You'll notice that uh, we've... Uh, put the uh, grade data from the last five years up here, uh, and you'll see that the trend is that students who uh, come from majority groups, so white and Asian students, uh, tend to perform much better than students from minoritized groups, uh, among which we include American Indians, Alaskans, uh, Black, Hispanic, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and those uh, who identify as two or more races. Most troubling, uh, we think, is the, uh, the DFW rate among this latter group, uh, which is double that of the majority group. So uh, we wanted to investigate what, would, what might be some of the drivers of this and what we could do about it. One of the well-recognized drivers of disparity in chemistry performance is math ability. And so here we have uh, a, uh, a graph showing the same group, but uh, the scores sorted out by uh, their math placement test. So math placement is uh, undertaken during new student orientation. Students will place into either algebra, pre-calculus, or calculus one. And what you can see from the data are that algebra students uh, tend to score much more poorly in the course, and they have a much higher rate of uh, failure and withdrawal uh, than do students who take uh, calculus. In fact, the trends are rather similar to the trends according to ethnicity. And so we asked the question if there was perhaps some relationship here. And if you look at where students place uh, in math, you'll see that uh, the underrepresented minorities tend to place more heavily into algebra and precalculus uh, than they do into calculus. And so starting off with a math deficiency uh, could be driving their lack of success in, um, in chemistry. Uh, and in fact, if we take a look at the uh, data broken out by uh, math placement, uh, here we're looking at the percent of students that pass the course with a C minus or better. Uh, we see that many of the, the perceived disparities actually uh, disappear. Not entirely, but some of them do. Uh, and so uh, we see the, the, there's no gap for algebra placing students. There's some gap for pre-calculus and then even a smaller gap for those who place into calculus. So we began to wonder if there was perhaps a way to use math placement uh, as a way of identifying students for intervention uh, that might also 
uh, at the same time uh, help underrepresented minorities persist in STEM careers. So our goals of the study were to identify characteristics who, uh, uh, who fail or withdraw from Chem 3A, and then to intervene. And our idea for an intervention was a summer prep course that would give these students a stronger start, a higher aptitude in chemistry and math, and also increase self-efficacy, which is the notion of a student believing in their ability to succeed. The program that we developed, uh, we titled Enhancing Student Chemistry Aptitude and Performance Early, or the ESCAPE program although I think some students wish to escape from chemistry altogether. Uh, it consists of a two-week summer prep course uh, that is uh, run using an adaptive math and chemistry learning software called Alex. If you're not familiar with Alex, this is a program that takes uh, chemistry topics and does a pretest for the students. They see how much knowledge they've retained from high school and then begins them exactly at the level where they are. So a student who is more advanced gets more advanced topics. A student who is, more, uh, who is less advanced gets uh, more basic topics. And they're able to work through the topics in a sensible order so that they can achieve. Uh, it's an, it's an AI-based program that's able to do this. So we chose students uh, based on their placement into algebra and pre-calculus from the summer orientation. Uh, we were able to attract 25 participants. Uh, out of a, a larger pool, and we had a pool of 33 non-participants who were invited but chose not to respond uh, to compare. Uh, we obtained informed consent from these and IRB approval for our surveys and uh, interventions. So what were the interventions? So uh, for the Alex, which was run as a, an asynchronous uh, intervention, uh, students were asked to learn 40 topics beyond their current knowledge. So beyond the pretest, 40 additional topics up to a maximum of 120 topics that are those that appear on the first exam in general chemistry. For the synchronous component, we required them to attend check-in meetings uh, uh, where faculty would be present who could both keep them accountable and also uh, provide office hours type support uh, if the students had questions about particular topics. Uh, we administered pre and post program surveys, and we also covered the cost of the Alex for these students, uh, plus a $10 honorarium uh, if the students completed all portions of the program. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce Emily Mundorf, who's going to tell us about what some of the results were. Oh, the outcomes, before we get to that, the outcomes were uh, we uh, obtained their first exam grade uh, and their final exam grade from the faculty of the department, as well as their final course grade. Okay. All right, so here's a group of students that we got. Um, you can see even though we did not specifically target underrepresented minorities, they were the majority of our cohort. A slight bias towards female, and we thought that there might be a, bias, a, a difference in the first gen population that turns out not to be the case. We got a range of different chemistry backgrounds. Um, however, 75% of them indicated two or more years since, so their chemistry skills are definitely rusty. All right, so here are the results from our pre and post surveys. Um, small numbers, nothing here is statistically significant. However, we see trends in the direction that we were hoping to. They're feeling less anxious, they're feeling more prepared, and they're feeling like their math skills are where they need to be in order to, to succeed. So they're feeling better after this, that's good. Um, I especially liked some of the responses we got to more open-ended questions. So we asked them what they gained from this program, so they got a better sense of time management, better understanding of chemistry topics. Uh, they felt more prepared and less anxious uh, and greater confidence. Relearning basic algebra, which is absolutely essential to succeed in general chemistry. Um, and I like the one on the bottom left as well. I was able to motivate myself early on before starting college. I had a specific goal and that encouraged me by a lot. And then when you ask them what we want, what they thought we should change, what we should keep, they seem to just want more of it for the most part. Uh, keep the weekly check-ins, make the program twice as long, continuously offer this program, add group, add some structure to it by adding group work and some mini lectures, um, faculty being working through specific problems more with the students. So they just seem to want more of it. And especially like the one we put up in big of offering this before any science related course to give students a foundation. All right, so that's nice they felt good, <laughs> but did it actually help? Um, and it does seem to loosely correlate with improving their first exam grade. So the number of topics they mastered in Alex loosely led to a better first exam grade. Um, 
and for the overall course grade, we do see a shift when we compare it to the cohort that was invited but did not participate. So we do see a higher median grade, B versus B minus. We see a 5% decrease in the DFW rate. Of course, though, these the students who joined our program were the ones who said, hey, I want to do a couple weeks of chemistry in the summer. So that could be a self-selection bias as well. What we'd like to do next is to be able to expand it if possible. We would like to increase the length and the expectations and increase the number of students that can participate. We thought it'd be helpful to have student TAs do the weekly check-ins, um, giving them a peer that they can already know and connect with before they step onto the officer campus, as well as add some structured synchronous remote lectures, make it feel a little bit more structured. We think it would also be really nice to have Alex as a chemistry placement program, make sure our students who start Chemistry 3A do have the skills they need to succeed. So we'd like to thank the uh, faculty of the Hofstra Chemistry Department for providing the grade data. Uh, Dr. Justin Tangelo and Dr. Siever Sidi for consulting with us on the project. Uh, the Office of Institutional Research and Assessment for providing the historical data. McGraw Hill Education, uh, the makers of Alex, and the Office of the Provost for our funding. Thank you very much. Um, hello, hi. Uh, this presentation, I'd like to present our study titled as Workplace Ostracism Among Employees with Racial Minority Background. Let's go here. Can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank my collaborators. They are doctor and master students in industrial and organizational psychology program at Hopkins University. They are um, Sammy Abdallo, R.D. Karabakh, Brian Goldfeder, and Sean Nakara. Um, human beings are social beings. We all prefer to establish and maintain high quality relationship with others. Matthew Lieberman published a book explaining that our brains are wired to connect with other people. Therefore, if we are ostracized or excluded by other people at work, we will feel stressful. Workplace ostracism refers to the extent to which an individual is being ignored or excluded by other people at work when it is socially appropriate to include. Um, a lack of research is that little is known about how racial minority employees uh, experience and response workplace ostracism. According to Kipling's uh, temporal mode, or a model of needs threat model of ostracism, um, ostracism includes three stages. At the first reflexive stage, the victim will quickly uh, detect the ostracism in his or her social environment. This will place a th strong threat on his or her needs to belong. The victim will immediately feel psychological pain and physical pain. Then the victim will go into the second stage, which is the reflective stage. The victim will cognitively process the information, try to understand why this is happening to them. They will engage in behaviors, try to fortify their threatened needs, and they will also try to rebuild their social connections. However, if none of this works, the victim will enter the third stage, which is the resolution stage. The victim will um, give up and withdraw from social or future social interactions. Our study focused on the cognitive and the behavior reactions to workplace ostracism among uh, social uh, minority um, workers. Richman and uh, Leary proposed the multi-motive model, which helped us to understand the relationship between ostracism and the behaviors. If a victim perceives that the workplace ostracism is due to one's own fault, such as I'm a socially awkward person, the victim will feel guilty. Driven by the fundamental needs to belong, the victim will try to um, conduct the pro-social behaviors such as ingratiation to rebuild the relationship. The second motive focus on anger and the revenge. If a victim perceives that he or she is being unfairly 
ostracized by other people at work. The victim will feel anger and engage in antisocial behaviors um, to vent their anger or to revenge. Um, counterproductive work behavior toward other individual is one type of antisocial behaviors. Therefore, we predict that workplace ostracism is possibly related to guilt and anger. Guilt and anger, respectively, will predict pro-social versus antisocial behaviors. People rely on social cues to make attributions. However, social cues related to workplace ostracism is especially vague and ambiguous. Victim will search for reasons why he or she is being ostracized at work. Uh, racial minority employees may be sensitive to their racial background. They may consider workplace ostracism as a type of racial discrimination. Therefore, they may make race-based attribution. Race-based attribution refers to ascribing workplace ostracism um, to the perpetrator's racial discrimination. According to this counting hypothesis, when a victim makes a race-based attribution, he or she shifts the responsibility from themselves, such as I'm a socially awkward person, to the perpetrator, such as they are racist. By discounting one's own responsibility in eliciting workplace ostracism, the victim protected one's self-esteem. Therefore, race-based attribution could buffer the relationship between workplace ostracism and the feeling of guilty. We collect data from um, th uh, 200 uh, full-time workers uh, with racial minority background. This is a longitudinal data set. We collected uh, three-wave data. Overall sample was comprised of 200 exactly racial minority employees. And uh, uh, the main age was 39 years old. There were 46% of males and 52% of females. There were 37% of blacks, 24% um, of Asian Americans, and 23% of um, Hispanics and Latino Americans. We used the established scales to measure our major variables. We conducted the latent moderate structure equations to test our hypothesis. We found that workplace ostracism at time one significantly predicted anger and the guilt at the time two. Secondly, we found that guilt at time two significantly predicted the ingratiation measured at time three. However, we did not find a significant relationship between anger and the CWBI. This is inconsistent from previous findings. One possible reason is that our sample was comprised of racial minority employees. This population may be less likely to engage in antisocial behaviors at work. Finally, we found that the interaction effect between workplace ostracism and the race-based attribution was significant in predicting guilt. Our model also included the other paths that are not directly related to our hypothesis. We also in, um, controlled age and the gender in the model. This figure presents the moderate effect of race-based attribution. The x-axis presents work um, ostracism at time one, and the y-axis presents guilt. The solid line presents high risk-based attribution, and the dashed line presents low risk-based attribution. As you can see, um, the relationships was, was weaker for high risk-based attribution uh, group um, than the low risk-based attribution group. In summary, Organizational leaders should be aware of the detrimental effect of workplace ostracism on employees' well-being. A company where racial minority employees are well included can provide a buffer to their social ostracism experience by creating a space where they feel belong. Thank you.
All right, hello, I'm Dr. Sabrina Sobel. This is my colleague, Dr. Vandana Vindra. We both teach general chemistry and we are the second chemistry talk, so we will be relying on what was presented before. <laughs> um, so uh, as was mentioned before, general chemistry is a big problem for students. Um, a science gatekeepers course, right? So um, all of our pre-health majors have to take general chemistry and then also engineering and physics. So with this being a first semester freshman course, you can see there's a lot of different majors that are there. Um, that means there's gonna be a lot more students. That means larger classes, 35 to 70 students per section. And these are usually a three credit class with four meeting hours where the fourth hour is devoted for problem solving. And so the current issues that we have in teaching this class is the problem with larger classes, a demanding curriculum, a fast pace, and we have mostly freshman students. So the purpose of this project was something that we came up with when um, the, um, uh, the invitation to put in an application for this money came up. And so I went to my, my colleague Vandana and um, asked if we could do something that we had been thinking about and use the money in that, pro in that profitable way. And so we wanted to improve the diversity in the pool of teaching assistance by creation of a new peer mentor program. Um, what we have on, on campus already is the peer teacher, which is um, a, a single honors college student uh, devoted to a class. We wanted to get more diversity and we wanted to get more um, people helping us in a way that was better uh, for the students in the class and the students acting as peer mentors. And so we wanted to select diverse students with at least a B plus performance in Chem 3A in completion of at least one other chemistry course. So we felt we had a good group. Um, they did not have to be part of Honors College. And so we wanted to get um, tied this into an undergraduate teaching leadership opportunity to encourage diversity of STEM professor, professionals and the, through the training and the mentoring of the peer mentors. So um, when we looked at our teams, our team selection, um, we ended up with four male and six female, three Caucasian, two African American, one Asian and three South Asian students. And one student was also registered with SAS. There were sophomores and juniors and seniors and they had earned a B plus and above in general chemistry. So the training format we came up with was both synchronous and asynchronous all through Zoom meetings. We did it as a workshop format during the summer. Um, and we used Blackboard, VoiceThread, and perusal discussions. So the scope of the training program is something that um, Vonda and I worked on in June, and then the workshop ran in July into August across three weeks. And so we wanted to not only talk about what is important in terms of the content they're teaching, but also how do they think about teaching and how they think about learning. And that's where we um, uh, really uh, feel that we um, made a big impact. Um, so uh, we uh, wanted to create a more supportive environment in a high stakes freshman STEM course to increase student success and, and also help the STEM majors who act as peer mentors to develop and practice some of the soft skills necessary for career success. And something we didn't write on here but was implicit in our process was that we wanted to make sure that we were providing role models that were diverse to the freshman students who are in this class so they can see all of these different kinds of students who are engaging in chemistry. Okay, so now off. <laughs> So these are the aspects of the training program that we focused during uh, our training. Uh, the first major aspect was building a cohesive team. Um, so the students created voice threads, introducing themselves, introducing the problems they've had in their careers, including ourselves also, we included that information. The students underwent a strength and weakness test, again, discussing with each other, acknowledging, learning more about themselves as they moved forward. And we learned about constructive and destructive group behaviors, acknowledging that we all exhibit those. So it created a normal sense, normalcy in not needing to be perfect, that we were who we were and we can work together. Um, we had a unit about minority role models. Each student researched different minority scientists, engineers, professionals from STEM fields. And we invited a minority professor to come in and talk to our students about the difficulties they have had in their own career. And this also at the end seemed to make them understand the difficulties that the URM students and professionals 
experience in their professional journey. We made a unit about, we established a unit about metacognition. Uh, it was a perusal mediated discussion, online discussion, and we engaged in this, this discussion asynchronously. And students learned to be more aware of what metacognition is, how do you learn to think about their own, about your own thinking. Um, we had a unit about student misconceptions in general chemistry. Students examined different research based um, comprehensive studies about the problems students are facing in general chemistry as of right now. Uh, it was not only quantitative as well as qualitative uh, areas of dis difficulties were discussed in this section. Uh, students, uh, we uh, learned about Socratic learning where we don't learn to jump in and provide answers directly, but rather lead the students to find their own answers in our uh, question answering during group work. And lastly, we ended with TA case studies from literature where our students became more confident by, uh, by uh, making them aware of the kind of issues TAs face when they're working with students in classrooms. So these different aspects of the training program were the students did some work asynchronously, and then we came together and discussed them uh, during our seven Zoom meetings. During the fall semester, the students came back and worked with our two sec our sections. And the, because of their uh, restrictions there in their own schedules, they participated in different ways. So not all students could come in to facilitate the group work because some of the schedules were conflicted. So in those students might have might offer office hours. They were limited to spending just 1.5 hours per week. Um, they also at times prepared content related material to be uploaded on the blackboard. That was in the form of short short voice threads, maybe you know five minute short uh, voice thread topics on. Uh, specific topics. They ran workshops, again, short workshops on uh, tar uh, target topics which were acknowledged to be difficult for the general chemistry students. Uh, they were available through email communication, so they created a more visibility for mentors. You know, the students could, some students felt more comfortable asking questions of their own peers rather than asking us, so they became a conduit between the student and us. And in addition, they engaged in a weekly communication with us. We'll meet once a week over Zoom for 15, 20 minutes discussing what was going on during the week and what problems they were encountering or how we could improve. So here is a general score. It's, you know, we compared two sets of data from our sections from fall 2019 and, to, and, and then fall 2021. In general, you can see in the first exam, this is I'm comparing the relative variability in their scores uh, uh, for the three, four exams, the one first exam, second exam, third exam, and the final exam. Um, in general, the first score, the first exam score, the variability is not that much because, okay, they have some high school background and the beginning material is not that hard. But then the variability starts going up by the second exam, where all of a sudden, all the disparities become abundantly clear. And as you can see from these trends that for both our sections, the relative variability, variability in their scores started decreasing, it decreased more this semester than in the past. So we're comparing two sets of data because intermediate data was not of uh, much use because of all the variabilities during the pandemic uh, exam, mediated exams. So, so we, uh, the final exam, in fact, is very tricky. And we find that the variability data in, for the final exam typically increases because that's when all the, it's cumulative and students are not able to, students coming in with weak backgrounds, all the differences become even more clear by the final exam. And we both experienced improvement by reduction in the variability in our final exam. And here is the general exam trends for both our sections. 
Uh, once again, the means for the first exams are typically higher. And now we experience that by the final exam, the means did not dip so much and our, the spread of the data was not that much, it was lessened um, in this semester. Um, once again, the second exam shows the biggest dip, but then the, um, we are attributing to some extent the presence of our peer mentors that are, uh, by exam three, once again, the, ex the average scores went up and our dis the, the grade distribution actually dwindled across the semester. So here are the students uh, who participated in this program. This is Team Bindra. These are the students who work with me. Ashley Miller, who was a sophomore at this stage. Sneha Dolatani was my, the peer team leader for this group. Um, she had worked with me in the past, and she came on board again in training over the summer and um, acted as a leader and took more of the leadership role in this group. And Kavalpreet is a junior, was a junior at the time. Kelly Ku is a senior, and Josiah is sophomore. So here's Team Sobel. And so Brendan Sperling has been my TA before. So he was the um, senior peer mentor for this group. And then I had Anurav Gosai, a senior. And these are all majors. Uh, for me, they were all majors in the department, but um, not, yeah. So we, we didn't, we didn't um, particularly uh, care as long as they were good at chemistry. Um, then I had Trey Rogers, who's a senior. I had Evan Zupani, who's a junior. And I had Nura Lee Rana, who's a senior. And also, um, one way that we um, sort of gave the students, uh, the peer mentors, a, a motivation in addition to the idea. Of, my students wanted to volunteer, but one of, one of the benefits of this grant was that we could actually pay the students a small honorarium for participating in this. And so their, um, their work during the summer and their persistence um, uh, was uh, better compensated, <laughs> is the best way to say it. And so these, these, these are some of the um, works that we um, uh, referenced. And also, we'd like to thank the program. So the, the program made it possible. And also, now we know that we can also uh, collaborate with our chemistry faculty to bring our two ideas together. Thank you. Thank you for those presentations. And um, I know you probably have questions, but as I said, we're gonna hold them till the end. So we're gonna move to our next three. Um, and these are the LGBTQ plus research initiative grant lectures. And so the first one is Gina Pontrelli and Amy Roberts from the Department of Physicians Assistant Studies. And their paper is titled Integration of High Quality LGBTQ plus History and Physical Exam Skills in Physicians Assistant Curriculum. Then we have Ross Smith from the Department of Counseling and Mental Health Professions. And the paper is The Perspectives of First Generation Students Who Also Identify as LGBTQIA+. And then Donna, our last is Donna Willenbrook and Mary Lemp from the Department of Nursing. And their presentation is entitled Effectiveness of Curriculum-Based Education on Nurse Practitioners' Student Attitudes Towards LGBTQ+, Intimate Partner Violence. So we'll move to the first presentation. Hi, I'm Amy Roberts. I'm one of the clinical faculty with the PA department. And this is my colleague, Dr. Gina Pontrelli, another clinical faculty with the PA department. So when we were first thinking about this grant and heard about this research initiative, we were trying to look at different literature and look at different statements. So we found two very powerful statements that were adopted. The VMA came out and said that clinicians really need to be restructuring their training and at all different career levels in order to figure out ways that we can avoid discriminatory care, especially learning how to deliver sensitive care to the LGBTQ plus population. That statement was further validated and elaborated by our governing body, the, uh, the ARC-PA, 
which is a governing body for PA education. And they validate this statement by saying that not only do we need to do this in the medical field, but we also need to look at this at the PA education and academic level. And we need to focus and promote diversity so that we can offer that sensitive care at that student level. So although these governing bodies, and we spoke to some students and we asked them just casually, how do you feel about delivering you know, care to the LGBT plus population? We found that students weren't confident, especially when it came to interviewing and physical examination skills. So we looked at further literature and studies and we found that although the, this was a priority with many of these governing organizations, educational interventions have been slow to address this issue. So as educators, we just found what can we do with our curriculum to kind of make a more robust curriculum and benefit the students and increase access to care and decrease these health, uh, health uh, disparities. So basically the purpose of our study was to not only look at short-term effects, because we all know that if we increase training, there's always going to be an increase in those short-term outcomes. So they're gonna feel more confident right after they do it. But the important thing to look at was, is this sustained over time? Are they going to still feel confident a few months from that? So we wanted to look at that short-term and long-term impact, just with the hope, like I said, to increase access to care, decrease healthcare disparities. So currently, when we were looking at our curriculum, we were trying to best see, well, where can we increase the LGBT plus education? Where will this fit into our curriculum? And we thought the best place that we could restructure this was a current course that we already had in a didactic year, which is the first year of P PA program. And we looked at our physical examination and diagnostic modalities course, where we teach interviewing and physical examination skills. So we looked at it and we decided to integrate not only one workshop, but multiple workshops. There was about four to our <laughs> workshops where we tried to augment these skills. And what we did is we had not only an expert, content experts come in and speak to our students on how to augment skills and care and deliver this sensitive care, but we also had a panel of individuals spanning the gender spectrum because we wanted our students to hear about live experience as patients. How can they care for them confidently? Talk about gender reassignment surgeries, things that students weren't confident in talking about. So what we did is after this workshop, we did pre and post assessments. We had assessments to assess confidence levels before they did the workshops. And then we did post assessments to see. And not only did we do it immediately, but we also tried to do this over time at two months out, four months out. Again, we wanted to see if these results and this confidence increase was actually sustained. The participation was voluntary and anonymous. It was IRB approved by the Hofstra IRB board. And then we basically obtained this data from one cohort of PA students to see how their confidence measured before and after delivering this work, delivering these multiple workshops. And I'd like to invite Dr. Gina Pontrelli to speak to you about the results. So for statistical tests, um, as Dr. Roberts mentioned, you know, this workshop occurred early during didactic training and then occurred throughout, you know, early clinical training. So initially we had 53 students that completed that pretest, and then immediately after the workshop, they completed the post-test. And then at two months, and then four months, there was a post-test during those times to see if the knowledge was sustained. So you could see the numbers there, and we, we did have a drop-off. Um, so what are we gonna do, right? We, we did lose a few. Um, and understandably, you know, our class size is around 60 plus, but these students have various schedules. Um, so what we did initially was the repeated t-test, right? We tried to determine if there was a change in results over those periods of time. So over the three periods of time. And then based on um, the existing N of 19, right, following the workshop, we um, then performed the one-way repeated ANOVA to see if there was changes over time in those 19 students that completed the two post-survey analysis. So what did, we, what did we get? What were our results? Um, we did have significant changes, right? In questions that pertain to history, 
and physical exam um, comfort level of the trans and LGBTQ plus patients. Some of the examples on our survey um, that students felt more comfortable in were that they can articulate the special needs of the transgender uh, patient, that they could summarize recommendations at the primary care level, anticipatory guidance, and healthcare maintenance of the LGBTQ uh, plus community. Um, and there were significant increases between the initial post-test and at two months, and again at four months. And that shows us there was sustained knowledge, right? So this did have an effect. And just to provide a visual here, you could see the results from the pre-course survey where mostly, you know, the students were uh, answering these surveys with strongly disagree. They were not comfortable, okay? And then just, you know, for sake of time, showing you that post survey response where we're now seeing they agree, strongly agree. There's there's more of a comfort level here and they, and they felt comfortable taking care of, of the LGBTQ plus population. So what are our limit, limitations? You know, there was a steep drop off. We did lose a lot of response, um, which then limits the generalization of our results. Um, but you know, I think that we have a start. We were able to pilot this. We can now move forward and expand it to other healthcare um, uh, programs, you know, and other educators like nursing and other health professions. So it's really important for us as educators, especially as clinicians, to promote cultural humility and equality. Students need to feel comfortable early on. Right? And this needs to be a horizontal and longitudinal integration like we did with our course where we had small group learning, workshops, bringing in the LGBTQ plus community where they were working one-on-one, -on -one, asking interview questions, physical exam techniques that maybe you know our, our routine faculty may not think about, right? So um, students wanted to feel comfortable. They were, they were excited about this. Um, and it, the study demonstrated, at least our, our small you know, study at this point, that there was an increase in knowledge. So we really need to work on you know, expanding. And here's a copy of our references, so thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Russ Smith. I'm from the Counseling and Mental Health Professions Department. I also am the Director of Residential Education on campus for the Office of Residence Life and I'm the Chair of the First Gen Pride Committee. Uh, I conducted a qualitative case study on the perspectives of LGBTQIA plus students who also identify as first gen. For the sake of brevity moving forward, I'm gonna identify these students as queer and trans. So the reason that I thought about this uh, was that I had recently done my dissertation and I had done a lot of research on first generation students and I noticed the research about first gens as it relates to their families were that one of two things tend to happen. Either first gens tend to feel strong family ties that pull them away from university life or they feel an intense um, motivation to succeed for their family and to give back to their family. Um, I know as a queer person that research exists on queer people that that's not necessarily the, the same for us. Um, that research shows that first gen, sorry, LGBT students often have a separation from their family. Um, they may not feel uh, accepted and oftentimes that leads to homelessness. So uh, that led me to this opportunity. Thank you from the provost office. I uh, proposed three research questions. The first was how, if at all, do queer and trans first gen students describe their relationship with their families. Two, how do queer and trans first-gen students describe the influence of holding that identity on their sense of belonging at college? And three, how do queer and trans first-gen students describe their relationships with heterosexual and cisgender peers? So uh, it's important to note that Hofstra's definition of first generation is that neither parent has earned a bachelor's degree in the United States. Uh, to conduct this study, I uh, recruited 20 total participants uh, in two groups. The first is a heterosexual and cisgender control group uh, who it consisted of eight females and one male, and then 11 queer and trans students who are identified here below with some of their breakout demographics. Um, it's important to note that although uh, not all of the students in the study in the, the queer and trans section um, were born female, uh, they all rep either identify as non-binary or female at this point. 
Data collection occurred between this last November and February of this year. Uh, it was in two portions, in focus groups that lasted 45 to 90 minutes, and in individual interviews specifically of queer and trans students that it lasted from 30 to 60 minutes. You can see that I conducted four focus groups, two queer and trans, two cisgender and heterosexual. That was primarily due to scheduling. So I had nine students from uh, each group in the two focus groups, and then 11 queer and trans students for the individual interviews. All nine of the students in the focus group who are queer and trans participated in the individual interviews. Two students did not. One signed up later than the focus groups, and one was not able to make it. Students who participated in a focus group received a $25 gift card, and students who participated in an interview could received a $25 gift card with those who participated in both getting $50 total dollars. Uh, the findings are preliminary. I'm still analyzing those, but what I've been able to determine um, will be described here in a, it, as follows. I've also included some uh, quotes, short quotes from students that I could fit on the slides uh, in the green section so you can see some of what they had to say that are referencing the points that I'm making. For question one, how do queer and trans first gen students describe their relationships with their families? Um, most describe their relationships as tenuous, uh, particularly so if they had family members that were not accepting of their identities, and particularly if those people were parents. If they had a parent or parents that were accepting of their identities as queer and trans, then oftentimes they spoke positively of that experience, sometimes within the same family. Uh, most of the students, uh, more students than not in, this in the, the, the queer and trans group had parents that were divorced, so oftentimes there were up to four parents in the mix. Um, the majority of students in this did not seek their parents for life advice for anything that ha didn't have to do with university life, which was in contrast to the control group of cisgender and heterosexual students who did. Um, I thought it was interesting that, I've, that many students who are queer and trans chose to create geographical distance by choosing Hofstra as their institution for uh, one of two reasons. They either chose to seek, uh, seek Hofstra because they, it was close to a metropolitan area in a liberal area. They perceived they would find more accepting community. Uh, they also chose to create geographical difference to make their family's influence on their lives lesser uh, and to create more of an opportunity to explore their individuality and to become their own person. Um, the queer and trans students also spoke of their motivation for college success, largely based on individualistic goals. They do college for them. Um, that's not to say that they don't oftentimes want to benefit their family as well, but their end goals for college, their plans for their monetary gain or their, for their professional success were for their own benefit, primarily. Research question two, how do queer and trans first-gen students describe the influence of holding this identity on their sense of belonging at college? Uh, I had hypothesized that perhaps queer and trans students might have a tough integration experience to the university, and the research results showed actually the opposite of that. Um, they were able to come to campus and find quick and positive community with other queer and trans students on campus, and that led them to feel like they belonged on campus. Uh, they almost all said they felt so safe and welcome specifically on Hofstra's campus. Um, and that was in, in contrast to the experience of, of cisgender and heterosexual first-gen students who felt a little isolated and alone as they had integrated onto campus and needed to find what oftentimes would either be a first-gen community or a community of peers that maybe identified along racial lines or some other shared characteristic. Um, it seems as though uh, students who are in the queer and trans group often were more free um, from ties from their family to be involved on campus, either because of geography uh, or because of the opportunity to really focus on their own development. And so the students in this group were often leaders in some of the bigger organizations on campus for student leadership. Um, some outliers to note are that bisexual students reported negative interactions primarily with cisgender and heterosexual students who they felt didn't understand their identity and questioned their identity. Um, they also, there also were students of color who spoke about having received microaggressions or experienced microaggressions on campus, although it didn't seem that any of those comments were related to their first-gen identity or to their experience as a queer and trans person. Uh, they were related primarily to race. Research question three, how do, if at all, do queer and uh, trans first-gen students describe their relationships with their heterosexual and cisgender peers? Largely, they don't have them. Uh, it seems as though um, primarily they're making community amongst other queer and trans students, or they're making community, like I said, among other shared characteristics. Only, if, I think, two students out of 11 spoke about having any um, connections with other first-gen students, and in all those instances, they were queer and trans as well. Uh, so I think it's important to note that these two groups of students that share a first-gen identity are not really connecting with each other. There are several impl implications for this. Uh, it seems that first-generation students who are queer and trans, their sexual and gender identity is strong. They have a good sense of who they are, and they're making, meeting each other very quickly upon coming to campus, and that's a very positive thing because they do feel a sense of belonging. Their first-gen identity, while they may think about it often, is secondary and tends to be a, a, a solo experience. They're not connecting with other first-gens. 
Uh, queer and trans first gens lack a community with other uh, cisgender and heterosexual first gens as noted. And so this creates a, an opportunity uh, both for faculty and for administrators. It seems as though there's an opportunity certainly to create affinity amongst queer first gens who identify, uh, queer and trans first gens who identify as the same as each other. They should be able to find each other and there should be opportunities socially uh, for them to connect. Uh, then following that, there should hopefully be opportunities to integrate queer and trans first gens with the larger first gen population on campus. Uh, for the first gen experience should be normalized both in academic and in social spaces, uh, that the experience should be affirmed and normalized and spoken about. And so there are opportunities for us to do that. Um, the, the quote that stuck with me is the quote at the bottom here. This is from an individual who is a female, uh, a, a person of color, the child of immigrants, a lesbian, and a first gen student. And she said that she feels like all of those individual aspects of her identity at some point were affirmed on campus, but at no point does she feel like she's fully affirmed. And so that shows us that there's a lot of work for us to do. Um, <clears throat> I. I uh, just want to thank again the provost's office for taking a chance on uh, an adjunct who is primarily an administrator. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to work together, administration and faculty. And so as the director of residential education, that's my job. Please find me. I'd love to work with you. Hi, I'm Dr. Donna Willenbrock. I'm one of the full-time faculty members in the School of Nursing, and this is my colleague, Dr. Mary Lemp. Um, so our study was looking at the effectiveness of curriculum-based education on nurse practitioner students' attitudes towards the LGBTQ plus community um, and intimate partner violence. Now, in our curriculum, we tend to spiral um, different topics throughout the curriculum. So in first, second, and third year, we will cover sort of the same uh, similar topics. So our students are introduced to the idea of doing the history and physical, and this really dovetails so well off of the PA program's uh, presentation. But we do the sexual interview of um, different populations in our first year. So in the second year, we introduce them to this uh, didactic education and some rolling role play about the LGBTQ plus community and the intimate partner violence. So what's the scope of the problem? Well, unfortunately, this is a large one. I mean, I think the numbers are staggering in terms of you know, um, intimate partner violence overall in the general population. The fact that one in five homicides are still committed by intimate partners is just still unbelievable to me. So how about, how does this affect the LGBTQ plus community? It does, it does largely. I mean, this is something that hasn't changed. We know the numbers of people who are affected by intimate partner violence in this community is high and COVID made it even higher because people were home together and there was an opportunity for greater violence. So um, as my colleague said, Dr. Willenbrock, the, this dovetails really very nicely with the PA program's findings, as well as with Dr. Russell, <laughs> Russ, first name, um, um, in terms of how people feel about asking questions when they um, uh, have to determine if a, a sexual orientation, the discomfort that they have with that, with asking sexually oriented questions and even asking questions that are um, uh, reflective back on, is there violence in the home? Is there, um, is there an opportunity for um, control over somebody else? So to preface this, the, the, the actual, um, experience that they undergo, the students are given upfront didactic on, um, on, uh, duh, on intimate partner violence, but also on uh, sexual, on human trafficking. So there is an entire, uh, it's at least a, a, about an hour upfront on human trafficking, on the scope of the problem, and on the impact that it has on our individual communities and our much wider communities in terms of global trafficking. Um, so that sets the stage for our students. And what we did with this was to um, take a look at the um, the uh, scope of the problem. And what we did was that we went on to a, thank you. Yeah. 
yes. That we went on and we gave, uh, we administered a pre-questionnaire, if you will, prior to the um, uh, experience and basically focusing on their knowledge, et cetera. So explore the NP student's knowledge and attitudes regarding intimate partner violence and specifically to the LGD, LGBTQ plus community to enhance the curriculum to bring greater awareness to the NP role in NPV, um, in intimate partner violence and again, LGBTQ plus community, specifically, you know, how comfortable are they asking the questions and how can we mitigate the discomfort that invariably occurs? Um, explore the techniques to promote empathy using reflection, legitimation, and exploration. The didactic education content experts we had in, as I said, so there were specific to human trafficking. It was also targeted to um, um, not just human trafficking, but to the LGBTQ plus community in terms of how they are targeted more than the mainstream heterosexual uh, uh, patients that we um, encounter. We did do, as we discussed, a rolling role play. The rolling role play was performed by trained standardized patients and our students had that didactic up front, and then afterwards uh, they were, um, uh, had the ability to ask questions in a rolling role play fashion, okay? And the faculty were there as facilitators to ensure that the, to one, to debrief uh, the students after the encounter along with the SP, and also to um, ensure that it didn't go off track, that the, that the uh, actual interview um, stayed on track and followed the process that we had anticipated would be pre-assessed. Uh, the pre and post activity reflection was anonymous and was not graded. And the, um, the, question, the same questions were asked pre as were asked post, and then students were asked to actually write a reflection uh, about their experience interviewing um, someone who is involved in perhaps human trafficking, someone who was involved in um, uh, the, um, in the uh, LGBTQ plus community, and again, specific to inter -partner, intimate partner violence. One of our uh, standardized patients was pregnant, and uh, the other standardized patient was not pregnant, but, but suffering from intimate partner violence. The domains that we assessed were knowledge about intimate partner violence and the LGBTQ plus community. The attitude of our students towards um, those populations, those select populations, and um, how to, uh, you know, what is in our practice and how to enhance that practice to account for um, taking care, again, of this particular community. Dr. Willenbrock? Okay. So <clears throat> all of our students are nurses, and as nurses, they are uh, mandatory reporters. Now, as nurse practitioners, that role is going to change a little bit because, you know, they may find out as a patient comes in to see them as a nurse in the ER, all right, something occurred within this, um, you know, in this family to this individual, uh, so now I have to report it to someone. In this case, it may be necessary for the nurse practitioner student to elicit that information. So it's a little bit different twist on the same thing. So we had um, 60 participants in our initial reflection survey. Um, and for the most part, they were fairly aware of what to do in their institution, but not 100%. Um, they knew that transgender um, patients were at greater risk of interpersonal violence. So that was a good thing. After the activity, uh, we had less um, students participate as we anticipated. Um, and we found that for the most part, the biggest issue was really not having sufficient time to spend with a patient to get to know what happened. 
because that's how you elicit this information. They don't usually walk in and say, you know, my partner just beat me. It's a matter of having a conversation. They may come in for a sore throat, and as you're having the conversation with the patient, you may elicit some additional information that'll get you to there. Um, but as, as practitioners, we don't always have the time for that. And these nurse practitioner students are feeling that. They're feeling like we'd like to do that, but we just don't have sufficient time. They still did report some discomfort with that sexual interview. And for us, that gives us a lot to look back at to add to our curriculum, to reinforce this, to, you know, to have them go through more opportunities for uh, working with a standardized patient who has a script, they're scripted on what to say, but to really give them more opportunities to um, explore this. So you know, for us, we, we do spiral this content, but we're gonna now look back at what we did and see where can we add a little bit more upfront at the very beginning, and how can we continue to support this as we go forward so that they'll have less discomfort and become better providers um, at the end. So that's, um, that's what we did. I think that um, it, it really was very successful and we're hoping to add to the curriculum in a positive way. So I wanna thank the provost's office and the School of Nursing for supporting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. We do have some time for questions. Allison is in the back walking around with microphones, maybe? Okay, well, there's Colin. Um, so we're opening it up for questions for any of the speakers and um, Hi. Hi, this is a question uh, regarding the peer teaching group. Um, how, much, how much were those kids paid? Can we, can we get, like, what was the compensation they were giving? Who was that? Are you answering? Yeah. Uh, the students received, each student received $100 for participation over the summer, and then they received $100 for the participation over the fall semester. Okay, so with that in mind, um, and given your experience, do you think it's fair to um, speculate, because you'd have to study this, but speculate that a, a student teacher program that enrolled, that had students sit in on the classes and then not just teach for an hour and a half a week, but actually invest maybe th four to six hours that was compensated something closer to what we would expect somebody hired to such a position. Do you think that might get you to even more results or not? No, because the students don't have that time. Um, we don't have grad students. So we mm -hmm. have undergraduates who have full and, and, and demanding curricula already, uh -huh. and they're trying to do research as well. So I think that, that that approach, while it's interesting, is not practical in our case. One last follow-up. Um, if these students were on work-study money? On work-study money? Um, that would be really good. Um, so, but, uh, but which ones um, uh, qualify for it? We want, we want to pick students who are going to be good at the job. And oh. this is something we also have with our stockroom staff. Mm -hmm. We pay a lot of our stockroom staff out of our, our departmental budget sure. because the very few of them qualify for work-study. Let me just end by saying um, I think it might be worth investigating how many of your students are working student jobs in the library or elsewhere yes. that could be switched to a job like this well, that might be, might be um, mm -hmm. effective given the impact you've had with just an hour and a half a week. Um, so one thing we did was we wanted to make sure that we paid them, compensated them for the time that they put into the workshop during the summer, even though it was synchronous and asynchronous, and it was not in person because of COVID-19. And also some students were not living, you know, they're not Long Island residents. Because they, they all had other jobs that they were doing during the summer. And so that was, that was something that we wanted to make sure that if you're going to put time into this during the summer and really participate in this, we're going to um, not make it a financial burden on you.
Hello. Uh, so my question is for uh, Dr. Smith. Um, first of all, I'm very proud of the of the research that you did because uh, I didn't really think it's a very uh, important topic to discuss. So my main question for you is, uh, what's uh, the major impact you hope that your research will have upon students and other researchers? Well, twofold, uh, and thank you very much for that question. That's my first gen mentee. Um, I, I hope that, well, actually, I know that in, in my position as the first uh, gen pride committee chair that I see a great opportunity to create a program specifically for first gen students who identify as queer to find each other to build connections and to connect with faculty and staff who hold the same identities right here um, and then the other was the, actually the last part of my presentation I strive in my daily work to incorporate faculty into the residence halls into the work that we do uh, and to find ways to incorporate learning as part of the residential experience and so my hope that is that through this platform um, that's made faculty members more aware that that avenue is open to them and that by simply seeing me, they know who to con contact to, to create those opportunities. Thank you. Larry, let me bring you the mic. Um, I'm Larry. I, I need this. I speak so loud anyways. Uh, I'm Larry Levy. I'm I'm uh, executive dean of the National Center for Suburban Studies, and it's a, a real pleasure to have worked with the provost office on this. In case you don't know, the funds from it come from something called the Celebration of Suburban Diversity, which is an event uh, which is organized by the center that uh, this year raised a, a couple of hundred thousand dollars for diversity-related programs in the provost office. Uh, and what was left over after that went into this program here. Uh, I, I say this now not to get for credit or anything, but the center does a lot of research. Uh, we, we get gifts, we get grants, we get contracts, and we are always looking for people who are interested in working outside of their class and room uh, work um, uh, to be on projects. Again, some of them are, are consulting contracts and some of them are, are gifts from uh, businesses and foundations. Uh, and if you have any interest in using your skills, if it can uh, it, it, uh, contribute to your uh, agenda, you know, come uh, reach out to me, reach out to Chris Neat, the academic director of the National Center for Suburban Studies. Uh, again, it, really anything, it's a suburban studies from A to Z, arts to zoology, and as you could hear, everything in between. And uh, the, the, the dinner is an enormous amount of work, but it, it's events like this and research like this that might not have been done otherwise that makes it worthwhile for all the people who work on it. So thank you for all your work, and it's just a pleasure to have the tiniest bit in, in facilitating. Thanks everybody for coming and thank you particularly to the speakers. Um, the presentations were fascinating and wonderful to hear and it's great to hear the scope of work that's happening um, across campus. Um, so thank you and have a dry afternoon after this. <laughs>